Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Nicola and in this video we will talk about Git. Specifically, we will explore how Git works under the hood. Let's get started. If you are watching this video, then you probably know what Git is, but let's summarize it anyway. Git is a version control system which is used to track changes made to files over time. It allows teams to collaborate on projects and provides a complete history of changes made to that project. It also makes it easier to track down bugs and revert to previous versions if needed. Understanding how Git works is a valuable skill for developers because it's widely used in the software development industry. Let's imagine that you're building a new world-changing application. After creating a prototype, you want to experiment with different solutions without losing your progress. To be more organized, you create dot .versions directory and save a copy of the project there. These copies are called snapshots, and we never modify them. If we want to make changes based on a version, we copy it to our working directory first, make changes to it, and create a new snapshot. But what if the project is large? Well, we can save some space by referencing files that haven't changed, for example, using symbolic links. This solution could work, but it's easy to accidentally change the wrong file or copy over the snapshots. So how does Git actually do this? Well, it does something similar. Git is a content addressable file system, which means it's a key value store where you can insert any type of content and get back a unique key that you can later use to retrieve that content. This store is often called object database and the values are called objects. The key is generated from the object's content using SHA-1 hash function which gives us a 160 bits long value. This means that the same objects have the same key, while different objects have different keys. Also, Git compresses the contents of the object using Zlib library to save disk space. If you've used Git before, then you've probably seen a directory called .git. This is where Git stores almost everything. For example, the object database is stored in the .git objects directory, and the contents of each object are stored in a file. The object file is named after its key. The first byte of the key is used to name the subdirectory, and the remaining part is used for the actual file containing the object. So, if you want to store the object with a key, let's say c612f8a, Git creates a file under .git objects c6 directory and calls that file 12f8a. The reason Git creates subdirectories is to reduce the number of files per folder, given that some file systems, for example FAT32, only allow up to roughly 65,000 files per folder. Let's go through an example where we store our main.cpp file in Git. Luckily, Git CLI already provides API to do this. We can use git hash object command to store the file in the object database. To see the contents of the file, we can use git cat file blob and then pass the ID, which is the key that we got when storing the object in the database. Note that we are just storing the contents of the file, but not the file name or any other metadata. This type of object is called a blob. When we change the main.cpp file, we can store it again in the object database and it will have a different ID. There are other object types in Git and we'll talk about all of them. The next one is tree. Tree solves the problem of not having the file name associated with a blob. You can think of a tree as a directory in a file system. It consists of other directories or files, which in Git terms means that a tree consists of other trees and blobs. If you inspect one of the trees with git ls tree command, you can see that all the folders show up as trees and the files show up as blobs. To make a change to a file and create a new snapshot of the project, we start with changing a file, then store the changed file in the object database, and finally, create a new tree for the full project. 
Let's say that we modified main.cpp. Nodes on the path from the changed file to the root are now different. All other nodes remain unchanged. This means that we can reuse the whole subtree and save space. This works well for large projects because majority of the tree remains unchanged in most cases. Once the tree is created, it's stored in the object database. However, we may forget the ID of the tree that contains this change, so we decide to write it in a file. We add a message describing the change and the author. It would also be useful to know how the project changed over time rather than just the final state, so each time we make a change, we also store the reference to the previous change. The information about a single change is called a commit. Commits are also objects, so Git stores them in the object database. We can use commit IDs to retrieve the state of the project at any point in time. We can also see the history of changes. Unfortunately, commit IDs are SHA-1 values, which are not quite user-friendly and they're difficult to remember. To solve this problem, Git introduces a branch, which is just a reference to a commit and we can give it any name. Next time we want to look at a project state, we can refer to it via a branch name instead of using the commit ID. Commits are immutable because their IDs are computed from their content. If the content changes, then the ID was changed too. On the other hand, branches are mutable, so we can change them at any time. In fact, each time you commit a change to the Git repository, the current branch is automatically updated to reference the latest commit. Let's recap what we've learned so far. Git stores objects in the object database, which is just a key value store. There are three types of objects, commits, trees, and blobs. A blob represents contents of a file, but doesn't include metadata such as file name. A tree represents a directory and consists of other trees and blobs. A commit is a snapshot of the project with additional information such as the author, time, previous commit, and so on. Each commit has a commit ID, which is just a SHA-1 hash value. Finally, a branch is a friendly name that we can use to reference commits, which simplifies how we find important versions of the project. Now we're going to see how we can use Git to improve our workflow. Let's imagine that we have a product that is running in production. The production version is on the main branch, and we want to add a new button to our website. We don't want to break the production version while working on a new feature, so we create a new branch called new button, which is based on the main branch. When the change is ready for the release, we can update the main branch to reference the same commit as new button. Git comes with a command that does this for us, and it's called git merge. It tells git to merge new button branch into the main branch. In this case, the merge is very simple. It just moves the branch forward. But what happens if somebody reports a critical bug just before we finish the new feature? Let's say that the bug must be fixed immediately, so we stop working on the new feature. First, we create a new branch based on the current production version. Let's call it hotfix. We fix the problem, and then we merge the hotfix branch into the main branch. We can now continue working on the new button feature. However, when the new button feature is ready for release, we cannot simply update the main branch to reference the new button feature anymore. If we do that, the changes we made in the hotfix would be gone. Therefore, we also need to keep changes from the main branch that are not present in the new feature. To do that, we find the version of the project that is common to both branches. Then, compare the snapshots from both branches with a common one, and save the differences. Let's call these differences D1 and D2. You can use git diff command to see the difference between two commits. 
if D1 and D2 don't overlap, meaning they don't change the same file, then we can apply both changes without any issues. Note that this works even if one of the features removes a file because the removed file will show up in the differences. However, what if D1 and D2 change the same file? Well, we need to do something smarter for the files that are changed in both branches. We'll distinguish two cases. If the branches don't change the same line in the file, then we can apply both changes to that file. After a successful merge, Git adds a new commit which has two parents, indicating that it is a result of a merge. But what happens if both branches change the same line in the same file? In that case, we don't know which one to accept. This is what we call a merge conflict. In this case, we can keep both changes in the file and maybe add special markers to indicate that someone needs to resolve the conflict manually. Fortunately, git merge command already does all of this for us. This merging process is called a three-way merge because it uses three commits to decide how to merge two snapshots that have diverged. One of the biggest downsides of merge is that it clutters the commit history. Git offers an alternative approach which allows us to keep the history linear, which many people prefer. This approach is called rebase. Let's say that you want to release the changes from the feature into the main branch using rebase strategy. In this case, we say that we are rebasing feature onto the main branch. So how does rebase work? First, it finds the commits from the feature branch that are not in the main branch. These are the ones starting immediately after the common commit. Then, the rebase applies changes made in these commits to the main branch one by one. And finally, it updates the main branch to point to the latest commit. Unlike merging, rebase doesn't create an additional commit which has two parents. Instead, the history looks as if everything was done sequentially. Applying changes from a single commit on top of another commit is known as cherry picking. That sounds very simple, but how does cherry picking actually work? After all, commits represent full snapshots, so what does it mean to apply changes from a commit? One way to think about this is to consider the difference between the commit and its parent. This would give us the changes that were made in that commit. Say that we want to cherry pick the commit F to the commit D. This means that we want to apply the changes that get state from the commit E to the commit F. Let's call these changes delta1. So can we simply apply delta1 to commit D? Let's look at an example where this approach wouldn't work. Let's say that we made some changes to a file in each of these commits. The file has lines L1, L2, L3, and L4 in commit D, L2, L3, L4 in commit E, and only L2 and L4 in commit F. The difference between F and E removes the line L3. So applying this change to the commit D results in the file having lines L1, L2, and L4. But is this really what we want? It's potentially dangerous to ignore changes that we made to get to commit D. Ideally, if there are overlapping changes, we would like to see a conflict and let users resolve it rather than blindly applying the differences. Can we use the same approach as merging to solve that? Remember that the merge requires three commits, the base, what to merge, and where to merge. We have what to merge, that's the commit F, where to merge it, that's the commit D, but what would be the base? If we use the common parent, like in the merge example, then we would be just merging all the changes up to commit F instead of just the delta between E and F. Since we want the delta, naturally, we could pick the commit E as base. As a result, the difference from E to F is exactly what we want. 
But what about the difference between E and D? Is this what we need for merge to work? It turns out that it is. Let's call this difference delta 2 and consider two cases. If there is no overlap between the delta 1 and the delta 2, then the result of the merge is the same as applying delta 1 to the commit D, which is exactly what we want. This is because applying the delta 2 to E results in the state D. If there are overlaps, then the merging fails with a conflict and it's up to the user to resolve it in some meaningful way. That's all I've had prepared for you about Git. I hope you learned something new today, and if so, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel. It would mean a lot to me, and I'll see you next time.